Here he goes. Come on. Easy, yep. Today, we're going to talk about progressive overload. I'm going to start off telling you about my first experience with learning this concept. So, this is the first principle in exercise physiology, at least it should be if you want to make gains. Okay, so when I was 14 years old, 1995, I was training at the YMCA. And the YMCA was there, it was a lot of characters there, pretty good gym, some good, you know, pro wrestlers, bodybuilders. But then my dad's friend, Steve Hall, um, who I was scared of, he was, a, he was a, an elite power lifter. He invited me to come train with him, so I was, I was super excited. So I didn't know what to think. I mean, I know everybody nowadays talks about, you know, wants to hug and talks about it's an embracing, inclusive environment or where people call it. This was not that. This place was like a gladiator-like hierarchy where there's a clear pecking order. And, and luckily for me, Steve was at the top of this pecking order. So I go in there, 14 years old, and we're gonna train. We're gonna do bench press. I didn't know what, I didn't know whether to shit or why my watch, as they say. I did not know what to expect. So I'm just sitting there. Steve walks up to me drinking like one of those, uh, it's like 90s, like pre-workouts called Rip Mass with the ephedrine in them. And he's just sitting there sipping on it. And I, I knew to keep my mouth shut, just go along with the plan. And you know, he, if he says jump, I just say how high kind of thing. So Steve stops, he's drinking his rip mass. He sort of squints his eyes and takes a cursory look around the gym. And he says, look at this place. The same people lifting the same weights, looking the same, the same strength for the last 15 years. If you take one thing from away, put his finger up like this. If you take one thing away from today, you got to put more weight on the bar. That was my first experience with progressive overload. Okay, so let's go another personal experience before we get into a little bit of the history of it. 2016 in Okinawa, Japan. So uh, at the same gym I just mentioned, Santa Barbara Gym Fitness, I had worked and stuff. So, you know, after I started working out there at 14, like 15, I got a job there. So I used to have a bunch of free time up there and, and I sure as hell wouldn't be sending the bullshit they're teaching at school. I was studying my books by Fred Hatfield, of course. And I'm, I'm reading these books and having a great time. And um, you know, lo and behold, fast forward, I'd like, I'm like living my dream. I'm doing seminars with Fred Hatfield, the coolest thing in the world. And we go, we're in, in Japan outside of Iwakuni at the famous, I, I don't know how to say it, but the famous, you know, chicken on a stick place. Everybody who goes to Iwakuni, Japan, knows they got the best chicken on a stick on that mountaintop. So we're at this place, and I bring up a mutual acquaintance of ours, and, um, and um, you know, it was, a, it was a fun time. You know, sake's are flowing, the chicken's coming out, the, the beautiful golden Japanese beer hear that traditional Japanese music in the background. It was just a very pleasant, nice experience with my hero working as an equal on a seminar. I couldn't, things couldn't get better. So anyways, it wasn't, I just brought this person's name because it had something to do with the business we were talking about. And Fred just kind of gives me that look he gives and I'm like, did I say something? I'm like, fine enough, I'm like, I you like that guy anyways. And I thought the guy was sort of a weasel too, to be quite honest, but I, I mean, I didn't like really dislike him. He's like, you know what his problem is? He's like, he's never fought tooth and nail. He's never entered the weightlifting priesthood and had to fight with every ounce of his body to, foot, to put five more pounds on that barbell. He's never done that. So here, it was pretty interesting. Another the sort of epiphany in this whole thing was Fred Hatfield, the greatest sports scientist of all time, the smartest mind in strength training ever, is not a former professor at University of Wisconsin is not saying, oh, he doesn't have this degree or that degree. He's saying the dude's never fought tooth and nail to put five pounds on the wall. So that is progressive overload. You go about the story of Milo of Croton, who the, the world champion wrestler from antiquity, you know, way before the time of Christ, this guy was a world champion wrestler. He was a world champion wrestler for 25 years. And as legend has it, that he had a baby bull. It was a calf. He picked up that calf every day until it became a bull. Then he carried that bull around the Colosseum on his shoulders. That is progressive overload. He's incremental, you know, he, basically that's what Milo did. He kind of, so we go back, my experiences, Milo, sort of the indirect, um, you know, forefather of progressive overload. And that's what it is. So basically to get stronger, to get more muscular, your muscles, have to go, they have to go beyond what they're accustomed to, okay? So there's individual differences that, of course, okay? Because, like, you know, how old are you? 
you know, your sex, your muscle fiber makeup, your training history, age, training age, you know, all that different stuff plays into it. And we could sit here and talk about that for an hour, but we're not. So there are individual differences. So you get what the point being is with progressive overload, we want to hit that adaptation threshold. What stimulus do we need to make these adaptations happen without pushing that too far and going backwards and getting yourself hurt? So funny example is there's some of these people online and they're, they're like really indignant about, you know, I've heard a couple of people not, they're indignant about not calling themselves strength and conditioning coaches. They're physical preparation specialists because I guess that's the Soviet translation. And they'll be like, oh, you know, I'm doing my like, like, uh, you know, latest, greatest Soviet periodization scheme program I came up with. So I did one a consultation with this guy and I'm like, you know, he's sitting there talking, you know, science around, I mean, I've got a master's degree in exercise physiology. This guy is like talking around my head. What the hell is this guy talking about? So he weighs 230. So I'm thinking like, oh, and he's wanting to do the consultation with me about the bench press. So I'm thinking like, <laughs> what do you bench press? I mean, and, um. He said 245, so I said, okay, that's 529, because I was doing, I did the kilos in my head. He's like, no, 245 pounds is someone from another country. I wasn't trying to be mean, because somebody from another country that used kilograms, so I was not trying to be mean. I'm like, oh. I'm like, what the hell? You know, so basically, point being, so this dude, um, I didn't really want to work with him. I didn't get that. So I said, why don't you do like 531 or something like that, some, I, you know, some kind of progressive overload program. So this guy scraps the Soviet so-called periodization program, goes to like the most basic program and makes gains. So I see it all the time, these so-called schemes of all these different, you know, like my heart rate variability is this and that, and like, you know, like the translated version. No, dude, like, the, at the end of the day, when they design this, they do not, they miss the most basic tenant. You have to progressively overload your training. You have to go, there has to be some way you do it. So it sounds pretty easy. The most pure way to do this is simply add more weight on the bar, but eventually the buck's going to stop. Here's why. If you bench press a bar right now, that's 45 pounds. You, you, do, you go up five pounds a year, a week, that's 260 pounds a year. You do that for three years, 260 times three, 780 out of the 45, you're at 825. You're now ahead of the greatest strongest bench presser of all time, Julius Maddox. So obviously that's not going to work to just keep adding weight. But in, a, in, in the sense of progressive overload, that is the purest, best way to do it is add more weight on the bar. But obviously you're going to run. So that's one way to do it. How else? And we're going to talk about how else you can do it. So besides increasing weight, you can increase total volume. What is volumes? Weight times sets times reps. Okay. So if you, you know, within reason, hitting that ad adaptation threshold. If you're training to get stronger and you know you could go, I'm gonna bench press the bar for 100 sets of 10, I mean, that's a ton of volume, but it's not because you're not over like 65% or so and hitting that adaptation threshold. So adding more volume to your training, it makes it more, you know, you're, you're neurologically, your muscular tissue is going to have to adapt to that you know, assuming you're not dragging the workouts out to eight hours or something. So adding more volume is another way to overload your training, okay? Increase training frequency. This is a great strategy um, as a short-term strategy. Um, a lot of times we bring up a lagging body part or just to, you know, do something different and like, you know, become neurologically more efficient at, at a particular lift. So lifts that are more complex or cleaning jerks or snatches, they do better with increased frequency, okay? Um, a lagging body part does better with increased frequency. People that are slow gainers, so slow gainers typically are predominantly more slow twitch muscle fibers, and they do, and um, because of that, they they it, it's a little harder for them to adapt. So they do better with increased frequency, and and a lot of times when you have a lagging muscle group, even though you might be a fast gainer, primarily fast twitch, you're going to be more that direction in that particular lagging muscle group, so it thrives with increased frequency. So it definitely can be a short term strategy, but for some of the slow gamers, it's actually a long term solution. Increase training density. Density is simply how much work you do in a set amount of time. So I remember at one sat seminar, Bill Kazmaier and I did together, he talked about, he said, just bust out the stopwatch. What's he means by that? Start timing how long you take between sets. If you do four sets of tricep extensions with 75 pounds and you rest 90 seconds between it, cut that into 75 seconds, then cut it down to 60 seconds the next week. Then down to 45 seconds. You you do you do it's the same total work, but it's in a lot less time, making it more dense. Okay, so you can do it that way. You could do um, 
you know, the same amount of work, you can do the same amount of, uh, or more weight in the same amount of time doing it more dense. So just getting more volume done in the same, in the same amount of time or using the same amount of time and doing more volume that makes your training more dense and in your overloading. And finally, one of the simplest ways, just increasing reps. If you're bench pressing 225 pounds for five reps, then you go up to six reps, you've overloaded your training. It, it's not rocket scientists and people, you know, it's sort of like people always talk about like, you know, the joke is the year's 2022, finally the year, you know, for, for fat loss, you know, we can, we can beat the calories in, calories out formula. It doesn't really work that way. Same way with this. Like you can look for gimmicks and all this thing, but at the end of the day, you have to progressively overload your training.